Let's do one more example, but this time we're gonna figure out what the profit margin is based on selling some type of service, okay? Let's assume for a moment that your service revenue, or in other words, the money that you're gonna receive from a customer that's paying you to perform some type of service is $1,000 of revenue. Now that could be $1,000 for window cleaning, or it could be carpet cleaning, or tree limbing, some type of service. Now let's take a look at the expenses of the service that you're providing. This is the cost of selling your services, and we're gonna take a look at the individual parts of that. The first one is the labor cost. Uh, you're performing a service, which means that you gotta pay somebody their time for doing that, and in this example, we're gonna assume that to provide the service at $1,000 of revenue takes 10 man hours. So 10 hours at $30 an hour, that's $300. But on top of that, there's some hard costs, right? Whatever it costs for the materials that are being added for the services provided, let's assume that hard costs are $150. And then of course, just like with the physical product, there are some ad costs for marketing. There's some sales commissions. We're gonna call that $200. Your total expenses are $300 to pay a person to do the work, $150 in hard costs, and then there's also $200 for the ad costs and sales commissions. That's a total of $650 of expenses. So let's take a look at the service profit margin. Remember that profit is figured out from taking your revenue and you're subtracting your expenses. So we started with $1,000 of revenue from selling this particular service. We're gonna subtract the $650 of expenses, and that means that there is $350 of profit that's netted from this sale. Well, what is $350 on 1,000? It's a 35% profit margin based on the math that I've already shown you. The most obvious way to tank your profit margin is to operate with far too high of expenses to generate good percentages. Alternatively, you may be offering your goods or services for too little. Since both of the profit margins in the examples that I just shared with you are well above the 25% mark, they definitely pass the profit margin test. So we can continue now to the second standard in our list. Standard number two, abundant lead sources. Select a business with an abundance of leads. A business becomes a business by offering something that people want to buy. Without the people in the scenario, you certainly do not have a business. At best, you have a costly hobby. The hallmark of a good business venture is leads are easy to acquire at a reasonable cost. Now let's pause and break this down and talk about survival lead sources versus thriving lead sources. Most businesses not only operate on a small margin, but they also lack an adequate supply of leads. A business without leads simply won't be in business for long. Never, and I mean never consider a business that struggles for adequate lead sources. Now let's compare that to a thriving lead source. You see, a winning business has an abundance of qualified free or inexpensive leads. You should be swimming in leads all the time, or at least have a plan for gaining more. If you don't got that, this is not the business for you. Oh, here it comes, devil's advocate. But Chris, how do I find leads for my business? Let me just go ahead and save you a ton of time and money. If you do not know the answer to this question, do not consider it a serious business option. You should never be enticed by a brilliant product or service if you're not going to be able to find the prospects to sell your products or services to. Many people mistakenly think that the key to business is selling a product or a service that they personally love or use. I don't entirely disagree with that, but I think it's actually an inferior way to pick a business. What if your biggest passion in life is making SpongeBob-themed quilts for horses? <laughs> is there an abundance and never-ending supply of free leads out there for this product? Maybe, maybe not, but you better find out before you set up shop and start buying reams of yellow yarn. Standard number three, simple business model. Select a business that is simple enough for others to run. A principle in philosophy and science known as Occam's razor states that the most uncomplicated way to do something is usually the right way. I live my life according to this principle. If a business model, including how you sell a product, how you make money, and how you interact with your customers is too convoluted, it doesn't 100% guarantee failure, but it certainly guarantees a lifetime of frustration. 
let's check in on what a survival business model looks like compared to a thriving business model. Most businesses have a complicated business model. And what's that saying from Murphy? If something can go wrong, it will. Well, one of my business mentors, Tony Robbins, taught me that complexity is the enemy of execution and ultimate success. While there are plenty of examples of complex businesses that are renowned for their success, I'm not here to show you how to build a billion dollar tech company with a massive infrastructure. I'm here to show you how to identify multiple simple but profitable businesses that don't require sleepless nights or overtime. Suppose the business involves complex technology or pioneering as in creating something that's never been done before. In that case, this is a huge red flag for me. In other words, pioneers and trailblazers, they're the ones who go first, but they've got the hardest job and they're sometimes the ones who get lost. That doesn't have to be you. Do not reinvent the wheel on this one. Instead, let's consider the thriving business model. Thriving businesses look at innovating or improving upon existing ideas and making them better rather than creating something brand new. If the goal is to ultimately have a business run itself, then you also need something that's duplicatable. Businesses that are the most duplicatable are so simple that you could bring in virtually anyone to help you run it. And isn't that the goal? The business model would have to make sense to them after only a brief explanation. Striving for simplicity is the fastest path to preserving your time while making excellent money on hefty profit margins. Standard number four, operations easily delegated. Select a business where you can delegate most tasks. Most business owners will tell you, along with some eye rolls and a few deep sighs, that fulfillment requires a majority of their time. In other words, the amount of time that it takes to market and sell a product is usually much less than the time it actually takes to fulfill on it. So how do you keep yourself from doing everything all on your own? You delegate. Let's take a look at survival delegation versus thriving delegation. Because most businesses operate with insufficient profit margins and therefore can't afford any hires, owners often become the lead or even possibly the sole workhorse in their company. This means that they end up working harder than everyone else for the least amount of pay and more critically for a nearly complete loss of their time. The end result is that the business ends up owning them. Now let's take a look at thriving delegation. If you want something done right, don't do it yourself. Hire other people. Just because you can do it doesn't mean that you should. Doing it all yourself puts you at risk of building your life around your business instead of building your business around your life. A winning business allows you to pass along fulfillment to others and preserve your time. Once you have procedures for delegating fulfillment, your next goal is to delegate marketing and then selling duties and ultimately become a business owner instead of an operator. The happiest business people I know live to delegate, but it's not a skill that everyone naturally possesses. The goal is to own successful companies, not operate successful companies. That is, unless you are prepared to limit your potential. If you struggle to trust others and distribute responsibilities, Start the soul searching process now and figure out how to let your guard down enough to let others help you. It's the only way to reclaim more of your time and still run a successful business or side hustle. You own the business, not the other way around. By the way, I can't help myself. I'm actually going to go off script for a moment and leave the book in the dust because there's just something that I need you to understand if you're listening to what I'm sharing with you. How can you own multiple businesses? if you can't figure out how to even run one business and having it run itself. Think about that for just a moment. You see, you're getting all this time back so that you can do it again, and maybe a 10th time or maybe a 20th time, and eventually you're surrounded with such amazing good people. Guess what that means? It means that you have the ability to have multiple streams of income, have products and services that create value for all these other people, and you don't get stuck in the business because it's not built around you. It was never meant to. Standard number five, customer focus. Select a business where the passion is for the customer, not the product itself. 
Beware of the enticement of doing your passion for a living. The most successful business owners fall in love with providing an outstanding customer experience rather than being enamored by their own product or services. It can be a hard distinction to make, I'll admit. This is because there are three primary roles within most businesses. Number one, the owner. Number two, the manager. And number three, the artist or specialist who creates or curates the product or service. The key is to ensure that you're not playing all three of these roles. All right, let's talk about survival passion versus thriving passion. Most businesses are conceived by people who have such a passion for a particular product or service that they turn it into a living. While passion can be a massive benefit to a business, it can also be a curse. A misplaced passion for products and services over the customer will ultimately trap you in a never-ending rat race that you cannot escape from. Actually, it isn't really never-ending. It usually ends with your demise and also the death of your business ownership and your dreams go up in flames. You could be bleeding money, but find it impossible to give up on your dream because your passion for the product has literally clouded your judgment. On the other hand, let's talk about a thriving passion. You see, a winning business creates value for the client and allows you, the business owner, to fall in love with the customer and not the product itself. Feel free to let your passion be a part of your business as long as you don't spend more than the first few months playing the artist or manager role. Otherwise, you're at risk of getting stuck in the business's emotion and lose sight of the bottom line and what it really takes to increase it, happy customers. All right, let's pause for a moment and summarize the five standards of business selection. Because if you wanna pick a winning business, you gotta check all five of these boxes. And by the way, if you're reading this and you have a business and you can't check off some of these boxes, you literally might have to take your business out to pasture and shoot it in the head. All right, number one, a robust profit margin. A surviving business is playing that old school game of a five to 10% profit margin. But a thriving business is aiming for 25%. And I'm telling you, some of my businesses, I'm at 50%. Some of them, I'm at 75% profit margin. Number two, an abundant lead source. Because a surviving business basically has a lack of adequate supply of leads, they're going to struggle and that literally might ultimately lead to their death. But if it's a thriving business, you've got more than enough qualified leads. Number three, is your business model simple? In a surviving business, you're dealing with a lot of complexity, and as a result, things are messing up left and right. But in a thriving business, it's so simple and duplicatable that it can basically run itself. Number four, it has easily delegated operations. Because in a surviving business, guess what? If you can't literally hire other people to come in and give you your time back by doing the job, you're going to get screwed in that business. This does link back to why I'm so passionate about strong profit margins. It's not this American greed like, ho, 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 look at all the money I'm making. It's if you've got a good profit margin, it becomes way easier to hire yourself out of the business to have a thriving business, which means that you can hire people to handle the fulfillment and get your time back because guess what you could do? You could do it again. And number five, let's talk about passion for the customer instead of the product. In a survival business, often these are companies that are confused. They're so into their product. They're thinking they got the greatest product on the planet, but they just can't find people for it. And they're delusional. They don't understand that in a thriving business, you've got to put your customers first. You've got to put their experience first. And don't just be average. Strive to be the best. Provide the best fulfillment. Put the emphasis on them instead of the product. And ultimately, that's what's going to lead to real growth in your business. Happy customers. Adhering to my five standards of a thriving business will protect you from making the most common mistakes that destroy many other ventures. These standards allow you to remain laser focused on being a business owner, meaning low time commitment, instead of a business operator, full time commitment. When I identify a business that meets all five standards, I move into the rapid launch phase to ultimately determine whether it will be a winner in the long run. Number three, how to start the four launch phases of a successful business. Once you have a potential business, the next step is to put that business through four launch phases. Number one, evaluate. Number two, experiment. Number three, optimize. And number four, hand off. Nine out of every 10 concepts will never meet my high standards. 
I actually enjoy shooting ideas down when they're missing even just one of these criteria. Doing so will save you an untold amount of time, frustration, and money invested in the wrong ideas. Phase one, evaluate. Phase one involves ensuring that the business can meet the three fundamental criteria and the five standards for selection. You must be able to answer yes to the following questions. In fact, there are eight questions because remember, I've already taught you the three fundamentals of business and for each of those three, I've got three questions. And then right after, I taught you the five standards for selecting a good business and there are five questions that correlate with that. Let's talk about the three fundamentals of business and the questions that correlate. Number one, marketing. Does the business have a way to acquire an endless supply of leads? Number two, selling. Does the business have a product or service in high demand? And number three, fulfillment. Does the business have a premium offering that can be delivered at a price that maintains a healthy margin? Now we're gonna move on to the five standards for selecting a winning business that I shared earlier. Number one, profit margin. Does the business have a good profit margin of 25% or more? Number two, abundant leads. Does the business have an abundance of free or inexpensive leads? Number three, simplistic. Can the business run itself and is it duplicatable? Number four, delegatable. Does the business allow me to hire others to do the fulfillment so I can reclaim my time and get on to other things? And number five, proper passion. Does the business create value for the client and place their needs even above the product? Well, as you're reading this book, you might actually be evaluating your own business or a business that you're considering buying or starting and ask yourself, how does your potential business idea stack up to those eight questions? If you can respond yes to all eight of those questions, then proceed to the second phase. Phase two, experiment. Never obligate yourself long-term to a business until you can test it before formally committing. Most simple business ideas can be tested and proven or disproven within just 30 days. Maybe you think 30 days isn't long enough to determine whether a business will be successful or not, but in my experience, 30 days is long enough to spot red flags. During that time, you can get a glimpse of what the process will entail from a profit margin and time commitment standpoint. Okay, Chris, so uh, how does this experiment work? Number one, first select a revenue goal and corresponding net profit margin that you think is achievable in the next 30 days. Number two, then work as diligently as you can for a month to hit that goal. And number three, if you haven't reached 50% of that goal of what you thought was possible in 30 days, then scrap that business idea and move on to the next. It's as simple as that. If the business has a good idea, you should see swift results. Do not delude yourself into believing that something excessively difficult will become easy with time. This is a recipe for massive disappointment. Do not waste years of your life, uh -huh, like I did once upon a time, and untold dollars on a business that can't generate enough profits to free up your time. Wait as long as it takes to find a concept that confidently meets these standards. I don't care how long it takes to find one. Find the next opportunity and then start this evaluation process all over again if that's what it takes. If your business idea passes the experiment phase, then proceed to the third phase. Quote time. Measurement is the first step that leads to control and eventually to improvement. If you can't measure something, you can't understand it. And if you can't understand it, you can't control it. If you can't control it, you can't improve it. H. James Harrington. Phase three, optimize. By now you have thoroughly vetted your idea according to established business standards and you've conducted a successful 30-day experiment. Now it's time to evaluate the business by documenting what works. Phase three is a 90-day optimization process that starts with measuring and reporting to determine whether the business is designed to win or sputter out somewhere down the line. The purpose of this optimization phase is to identify three fundamental elements that you need to know before you can successfully delegate any part of your business to somebody else. Number one, key performance indicators or KPIs. Number two, critical drivers. And number three, standard operating procedures or SOPs. Element number one, 
key performance indicators, KPIs. KPIs are measurable values that demonstrate how effectively a company is achieving key business objectives. These are the weekly numbers that matter in any business. There are literally hundreds of potential KPIs that you may eventually want to consider. Still, there are only three KPI categories that really matter, and they just so happen to be the same as the three business fundamentals, marketing, sales, and fulfillment. Your KPIs are the best tool to determine whether you are on track to hit your target revenue or net profit margin. In the beginning, you will use KPIs to prove or disprove that the business will allow you to hit revenue and margin goals. In other words, KPIs will reveal if your business can pay all of your expenses and still net at least 25% without you working full time. Yes, it may feel like there are millions of things to track, regardless, Ultimately, just a handful of key performance indicators is all that you really need to reveal a business's potential. The KPIs you follow during the 90-day optimization period should be able to answer the following three questions. Number one, how many leads am I generating? Number two, what percentage of those leads are converting into sales? And number three, how satisfied are my customers after both the sale and fulfillment processes are complete? These three questions are just the beginning, but they will help you get started tracking the correct information. In addition to answering these three questions, always calculate revenue and net profit margin to determine whether your business is on target at the end of each week. Allow me to go off script outside the book for just a moment and give you a little bit of bonus. You see a KPI, it's the goal, it's the result, it's the revenue, it's the whole reason, it's the thing that the business has to be able to produce that you're measuring for this whole thing to actually work. And it is something that you have to measure every single week because if you're off target, you don't wanna find that out three months later, you certainly don't wanna find it out a month later. At the end of every week, you should be able to look and say, hey, guess what, we are on target or we are off target and that's why KPIs are really important.